This will be a review and overview of the 2021 Lubbock Lectureship book, A New Heaven and a New Earth. This topic was put together because a growing number of young preachers have started believing that the earth will be renovated or changed in some way at the final coming of Jesus and that the saved will be on this renovated earth for eternity. This is a teaching that many evangelicals and others think is supported by scripture. So this book is designed to give us more information on the topic and to show that this earth will not be renovated, but will be destroyed and the saved will go to that place called heaven that has nothing to do with this earth that we're on now. Some of my overview uh, and this review is going to be short on some chapters and other chapters will be longer. It just depends on uh, what the content of the chapter is. Before I begin, I want to share some background about this project. I started working on this back in November. However, I had an extremely busy schedule as I was finishing up my senior year as a full-time college student. And that is why it has taken me almost a year to complete this. You will not find an in-depth overview or review like this anywhere else on this book. If you look below this video, I'll put a link to where you can get the book and I will put a link to where you can watch and listen to the preachers preach these lessons from these chapters. Now I'll tell you that the book contains more information than what they will present in the videos. Now you need to keep in mind that the writers will at times speak generally about the new heaven, new earth doctrine, because there is no way they can cover all the various views of this doctrine. And while you might want one writer to deal with something specific you're interested in, there's only so much they can cover with the assigned topic that they're given. You might view some of the writers as being more aggressive than others, but don't allow one writer to cause you to miss out on some great material from all those who have contributed to this book. With that being said, let's get into it. Chapter 1 lays out the argument that God is a just God and we have the final say. In other words, our opinions nor our ways can change God's ways and His judgments. We must always submit to His way. In chapter 2, Tommy Hicks points out some of those in the past that taught the idea of a renewed earth, such as Alexander Campbell, Moses Lard, David Lixcomb, and others. He also points out how these are just men, and they are not the authority on the issue. He talks about how Jesus would use earthly things to explain spiritual things and the spiritual realm. The point in this is if Jesus used earthly things to describe what the new spiritual realm would be like, would it make sense for the earthly realm to be the spiritual realm? He also points out how the book of Enoch talks about a renewed earth as well. He continues to list several of the early church fathers who also taught the renewed earth idea, such as Arenas, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, Arielis Augustine, and later men like John Calvin and even Barton Stone. The final point is that the doctrine of the renewed earth has been around a long time, even before the church was established, as can be seen in the book of Enoch. But it doesn't make this teaching true. In chapter 3, Ryan begins pointing out how the end time views have been proven to be false and that we should be concerned about teaching the truth about the end times, which of course I agree with. He will show that the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah chapter 11 is not talking about some future earthly kingdom, but it refers to the church that started at Jesus' death. I see this chapter refuting the rapture doctrine more than anything else because they think that Jesus will return to the earth and reign over his earthly kingdom for a thousand years. But the writer does mention that we will never have any kind of earthly kingdom or heavenly kingdom here on earth because Jesus will deliver the kingdom slash church to God, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Paul teaches that we will meet Jesus in the air and be with him forever, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17. As I think about this idea of heaven being on a renovated earth or God creating a completely new earth, I would have to ask the question, why? Why have Christians meet Jesus in the air just to put them back on a renovated earth or a new one? What exactly was Jesus preparing for in John 14 so that we would be where he is? These are the questions I have regarding heaven being on earth in some form. In chapter 4, Greg talks about the one hope and what it means. He points out that hope is not found in evolution or philosophies, 
but is only found in God. He also points out that part of our hope is in the resurrection as our natural bodies is raised and transformed into a spiritual incorruptible body. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 41 through 44. He also points out how John didn't know the details about what our spiritual bodies would ultimately be like. 1 John 3 verse number 2. But we know that our focus is on the spiritual and not the physical. He also makes some great points about how Scripture never says that Jesus will return to the earth, but that we will meet Him in the air. We also know that Jesus cannot reign on earth because He is a son of Coniah, Matthew 1, verse number 11. And no son or descendant of His can sit on the earthly throne of David, Jeremiah 22, verse number 30. However, Jesus is reigning as King right now at the right hand of the Father, which is, in a spiritual sense, he's reigning on the throne of David, but not on the earth, Acts 2, verses 30 through 35. He also admits that we are not given many details about the location of heaven, but it seems clear from Scripture that it is not on a renewed earth or a new one. He also points out the problem with teaching that heaven will be on a renewed earth or a new earth because this is saying more than what God's Word says. And we are warned not to do that. Also, to make the earth our focus is to make God live on the object He created as a temporary home for man. So basically, His footstool ends up becoming the place that He dwells with us, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. The writer points out that promoting the renewed earth doctrine is false and needs to be corrected. He also claims this teaching is causing division. It was taught on a podcast program called Radically Christian. He said that those who taught this doctrine on this podcast need to be marked and avoided. He claimed souls likely have been and will be led astray by their podcast. Now I'm all for correcting error, but in my opinion, the writer didn't give ample evidence of what kind of division this teaching is causing or how one is led astray by it. Perhaps there were things talked about on the podcast that were deserving of marking and avoiding them, but nothing was presented in the chapter other than them teaching this false idea that there will be a renewed earth or a, a new earth that's created. My end time view certainly can be twisted to destruction. I haven't seen or experienced where this teaching has caused division yet. If it has, I'm certainly against it. And while I think Greg could have been more specific on why he said they need to be marked and avoided, I think he made a good case against the renewed earth or new earth doctrine. In chapter 5, Clint will tackle the idea of how if heaven is going to be on earth, then wouldn't that mean that some of the songs that we sing about heaven are false? He points out that singing is how we praise God and how we proclaim God's word. He also points out that we shouldn't sing anything we wouldn't preach. If the renewed earth or new earth view is true, then we should stop singing songs like Above the Bright Blue, An Empty Mansion, No Tears in Heaven, Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims, and many others, because they refer to this earth as not being our home. The point is, is that if you are going to teach that the renewed earth or new earth doctrine is where heaven is going to be, you need to get rid of those songs that speak of heaven being up or in some other place other than this earth to be consistent with your doctrine. In chapter 6, Glenn will explain why the renovated earth doctrine is materialistic. He said that some think that the curse of the earth will be removed and it will be like it was when Adam and Eve were in the garden. He points out how there are only a few passages that talk about new heavens and earth, such as Isaiah and Peter. He also points out that when it is mentioned in Revelation 21 verse 1, the word heaven is in the singular, and he deals with these three points. First, he talks about how those who teach this doctrine misapply the verses they use. He talks about how those who teach that the earth will be made better speculate about what will be better. He mentions how N.T. Wright of the Church of England seems to be a popular writer among many younger preachers. And he holds the renovated earth view and compares our reward in heaven as being like a beer in a refrigerator and that Jesus will bring it to us when he returns to the earth. 
Glenn quotes Hugo McCord, who points out that God, angels, and the Holy Spirit are all spirits. Even though Jesus became flesh and was raised bodily, we know that He is back in heaven, but not in His fleshly body that they knew, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. He further points out that we will have spiritual bodies, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, whenever we go to heaven, and natural bodies. He makes the point that the phrase heavens and earth is being used to describe one spiritual universe, which is heaven. He points out how they misapply Solomon, saying the earth will abide forever in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse number 4 because the word forever doesn't always mean for eternity, and context will bear that out. Of course, Peter makes it clear that the earth will be burned up in 2 Peter chapter 3. Hugo disproves the idea that the word burn in 2 Peter 3 verse 10 could mean discover instead. And finally, he points out that we will go where Jesus is, John 14. Thus, Glenn says that the renovation doctrine is materialistic. Second, he points out how they misapply the end of time. And third, he says they misapply typology. Some of the basic points he makes are how Christians are described as pilgrims and how we are just passing through this old world and how we look forward to heaven. In other words, it doesn't make much sense to say that we are just passing through this materialistic world just so that we can come back to the same yet renovated earth. Again, the Bible says we are to meet Jesus in the air, not on the earth. As John points out in John chapter 14, he has gone to prepare a place for us so that we can be there with him. That makes no sense if the earth is to be renovated on the judgment day. In chapter 7, Stephen Atnip deals with the world to come in Hebrews. The best way to sum this chapter up is by quoting what he writes on the first page. However, there are four concepts in Hebrews that shows the idea that a renovated earth is not God's plan for this present earth. First, a contrast with the eternity of Christ versus temporal nature of the present earth, Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 11. Second, a simile showing that this earth will be changed like one exchanges one garment for another, an exchange and not a renovation, Hebrews 1, verses 11 through 12. Third, the comparison of our wilderness journey with Israel's wilderness journey, wherein Israel left Egypt for a new land of rest, not a renovated Egypt, Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 19. Finally, the fact that the final land of rest to which we are going was created from the foundation of the world at the same time this world was created, Hebrews 4, verse number 3, thus all things considered, the two cannot be the same world. Of course, he expounds on these points and gives us an in-depth look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5, and also uh, he talks about the rest of the chapter. In chapter 8, Terry Hill answers the question about what the meek shall inherit, the earth means. The first thing he points out is that there are no physical blessings given in the Beatitudes because they are all spiritual blessings. He further points out how this cannot refer to a renovated earth because Jesus can never be king or priest in this earth again. Yet he is king and high priest right now. The scripture teaches that the saved will be with Jesus where he is, John 14, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we cannot be with Jesus on this earth, whether it is renovated or not. Besides, Jesus already said his kingdom is not of this world, John 18, verse 36. So basically, he shows that the earth, the meek, will receive is that which is found within the spiritual kingdom of God along with the other spiritual blessings mentioned in the Beatitudes. One other noteworthy thing he points out is the context of new heaven and new earth that is in Isaiah chapter 65 and chapter 66. The context in which God's people will be called by a new name when all come to worship God, this happens in the first century. However, when Peter and John talk about the new heaven and earth, the earth is going to be destroyed. But in the new order of things, there will be peace and righteousness, and it will be when Jesus dwells with his church, which cannot happen on the earth. These are all great points that show why the renewed earth doctrine doesn't make any sense. 
In chapter 9, John Grubb talks about soul sleeping and the annihilation of the lost. He points out that the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists, they believe this idea that once the lost die, they cease to exist. And while this is a very comforting thought, this is not what the Bible teaches on the matter. And Mr. Grubb points this out using Scripture. He also talks about the body, the soul, and the spirit. In chapter 10, Tom House answers the question, Where are the dead now? He briefly mentions what Egyptians, Islam, and Buddhists believe about the afterlife and then explains what happens to our body, which returns to dust and how our spirit returns uh, to God. He also explains how we go to the waiting place called Hades and he explains that there's two divisions in Hades, which are Paradise and Tartarus. In chapter 11, Daniel Steersman deals with the city that comes down from heaven in Revelation 21, verse number 2. Those who hold the renovated earth view believe that the city coming down from heaven indicates that heaven will be this renewed earth. But Daniel attempts to give the ideas from both camps. He quotes from several different people, but he concludes his chapter with eight points that show that the city coming down doesn't mean that heaven will be part of a renewed earth but it's something new. It is something uh, different that has nothing to do with this physical earth that we're, all, that we're on right now. Now this is a good chapter to read to gain more of a balanced uh, approach to both sides of the issue. In chapter 12, Anthony Flunder answers the question, is God moving to a consummated earth? Some religious groups like Jehovah Witnesses and those who believe in the rapture doctrine believe that the earth will be renewed and never destroyed. Anthony makes three main points that the consummated earth advocates believe. Number one, the earth will not be destroyed but preserved. Number two, heaven and earth will be consummated. And number three, God is moving to the consummated earth. However, he will argue that the scriptures teach that number one, the earth will be destroyed and pass away. Number two, heaven and earth will not be consummated. And number three, God is not moving from heaven to a consummated earth. Of course, he points out how Peter says, the earth will be burnt up and not renewed. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13. Jesus makes the point that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not, which shows the temporary nature of the earth. And though some try to use Ephesians 1 verses 7 through 10 to teach that God will unite heaven and earth, people are missing the context because this is talking about uniting Jews and Gentiles together as one church, not the combining of heaven and earth. He points out how men like N.T. Wright have created this consummated earth doctrine because it cannot be found in Scripture. He points out how we are to look to Jesus and how heaven is described as being up, and that is, it's somewhere other than this earth. Our treasure is to be in heaven and not some man-made renewed earth. Of course, where Jesus said, everything here is going to be destroyed. It's not going to be able to last. Now, those who think that God is going to make his home on a renewed earth, they think that Passages such as Revelation 21 verses 1 through 3 teaches this. But we must not forget scriptures like 1 Kings 8 verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. When Jesus returns, he will not set foot on the earth. Rather, Christians will meet him in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, and we will be taken to heaven where Jesus has been, pre been preparing a place for us. Again, John 14, verse 1 through 3. These points, again, prove, I believe, that the renewed earth doctrine is not true. In chapter 13, Tom discusses the promoters of the heaven and earth doctrine. He stresses the point that he spent many hours listening to and reading the views of those who hold the renewed earth view and he names several preachers who promote it. He says that most of them claim that it is not a fellowship issue, but he says that it is a fellowship issue because the teaching is dividing the church. He points out how others, such as those who teach the 8070 doctrine, also started out saying their end time view wasn't a fellowship issue, but then it became one. And that group has evolved and accepted many other false things that the Bible doesn't teach. So, the same thing can happen to these new earthers 
just as many in the denominational world have believed in a heavenly slash earthly reign with Jesus, which is part of the rapture doctrine. After studying their materials, he concludes that they use inductive reasoning exclusively and never use deductive reasoning. Now, if you want to know more about that, get the book because he explains these things in details. Now, he points out how they use a lot of Old Testament passages dealing with specific situations and then takes the conclusion from those passages and makes it fit the New Testament passages, like 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 11. He goes on to give some examples of how they use circular reasoning and will redefine terms and meanings of easy to understand passages. They want to make the earth literal every time and he shows how they use improper reasoning from the Old Testament to come to their conclusions that the earth will be renewed and God will bring heaven to the earth and that we will dwell with him on this renewed earth. He also gives some examples of deductive reasoning from men like Wayne Jackson and Keith Mosher. Tom then makes several if-then arguments to show how the new heaven, new earth doctrine comes to false conclusions. In chapter 14, Garland Robinson gives a practical lesson on how we are to conform to the Word of God and not try to change it or invent new teachings from it. In chapter 15, James Rogers talks about the Judgment Day, and it is a good read, but it doesn't really cover anything about uh, the new heavens and new earth doctrine. In chapter 16, Michael Light will answer the question, what makes the renovated earth doctrine damnable? First, he points out how easy it is for those who don't study God's Word and are ignorant of it to be misled by popular uh, denominational scholars. They get so infatuated with these writers that they will believe the renovated earth doctrine because they teach it. He names some of these popular writers and deals with several pet phrases they like to use to make it out like we have uh, physical bodies or we're going to have physical bodies like Jesus before his ascension and that we'll be here on this earth. Now he continues and he points out that there are certain things we can disagree on and you know it's not going to be a heaven or hell issue such as would Cornelius be considered saved under the law of Moses before he obeyed the gospel? He also points out how we should withdraw fellowship from those who refused to stay true to the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse number 6. He says, doctrine becomes sinful when it contradicts the Lord's teaching. He gives the example of John 14, verses 1 through 3, and Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, to show that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, and it is that place that will be taken, which is not on the earth. Jesus also compares the difference between heaven and hell, saying that our treasure is in heaven and that the things on this earth will not last. He adds that doctrine becomes sinful when it raises doubts about the meaning and truthfulness of the text. He gives several scriptures that show that heaven is in another place, and he says the problem with making heaven be on the earth in the end, it causes us to have to, uh, or causes us to have to reinterpret every time the word heaven is used in scripture. He compares it to theistic evolution, which tries to blend creation happening over millions of years with what God's word says, which of course causes confusion. He also says that a doctrine that encourages people to follow the language of Ashdod, Nehemiah 13, verses 23-25, that it becomes a sinful doctrine because they are setting God's word to the side and are embracing the teachings of popular denominational teachers on this matter and other matters. Now I can see where Mr. Light is coming from, but he is painting a broad stroke that doesn't apply to everyone who is dabbling in this doctrine, as some of them don't agree with each other on different points. It kind of reminds me of the early days of the 80-70 doctrine in which those who taught it and got caught up in it didn't think it was that big of a deal and that it wasn't a heaven or hell issue but today it has blossomed into that way of thinking. And many of them can't agree on the details of their doctrine either. Now the reason I point this out is that while the new heaven, new earth uh, doctrine that is gaining popularity may uh, not seem to be really all that important or may be considered harmless, we need to be aware that it can turn into a doctrine that divides congregations and draws lines in the sand. Now, I can confirm that Mr. Light is correct about how many Christians 
are infatuated with non-Christian scholars such as N.T. Wright and others. In fact, many Christian colleges tend to give their students books from men like these which elevate their teachings. You know, I'm friends with many preachers on Facebook and I've seen uh, many of them who are enamored with the teachings of the popular non-Christian writers. So it can become a very serious issue when Christians start quoting and following and, and studying these sources instead of reasoning from the Bible for themselves. So it can become a fellowship issue, but I think we need to be careful about disfellowshipping a person who is just leaning in that direction. Instead, we should patiently teach them the truth and encourage them to study the matter more deeply. Obviously, if they start dividing the church over this doctrine, then they should be marked and disfellowshipped. Next, Austin Wiggins talks about the resurrected bodies in eternity in chapter 17. He starts out with a great warning from Paul, Colossians 2, verse number 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. He expresses the thought that those who are teaching this new doctrine are clamoring for a renewed earthly utopia. He gives a simple lesson describing how the resurrection is a factual event, and he gives several examples of people being raised from the dead in the Bible. He also talks about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which is extremely important to all Christians because if he wasn't raised from the dead, neither will we be raised from the dead. He continues to talk about the day of judgment when all will be resurrected. He gives some examples of those who are skeptics of the resurrection. He also makes the point that Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, which means that we also will be resurrected as he was. We will be raised bodily, and our bodies will be transformed into a body like Jesus. But even John said he didn't know the exact details of what that body would end up being like in 1 John 3, verse number 2. He then offers some answers to critics who teach the renovated earth doctrine. He specifically deals with things written by Luke Dockery. For example, men like him will try and say that Jesus' resurrected body was the body that we will have. They would point out how he was able to come into a room with the disciples behind locked doors and how some did not recognize him in other places. Still, all these things don't change the fact that Jesus was in his physical resurrected body and he didn't have to have some sort of special body that would pass through walls or cause him not to be recognized because all of these things could easily be done through miracles. He also points out how this doctrine cannot be found in Scripture without redefining or re-explaining terms and verses. There are more things he points out, but you'll have to read the chapter yourself to learn what they are. Ronnie Hayes covers the topic of hell, Gehenna, in chapter 18. It is a good read, but it doesn't deal with anything specifically about the renovated earth doctrine. In chapter 19, Heath Stapleton deals with the times of the restitution of all things. He does an excellent job of explaining their views, and he points out how that they have differing views among those who hold the new heaven, new earth doctrine. So he's not going to be able to get it right for everyone. According to many of them, the restitution of all things will happen when Jesus returns, but it will be a time when the planet is restored to how it was in the Garden of Eden. Jesus will set up his throne on earth and rule over New Jerusalem. N.T. Wright is one of the champions of this doctrine that many have been convinced by, yet he uses an example about beer in the refrigerator as an example to teach his doctrine, which most don't like. Mr. Stapleton goes on to show that these teachers have similarities to other groups, but they are not specifically like premillennialists or postmillennialists or Jehovah Witnesses. This chapter is a great read, and it would be the chapter I would recommend for you to read if you didn't read any of the other chapters because he continues to explain many things about what most of them believe and why it will be that the earth will be restored and what will happen when it does. So the earth is supposed to be restored, and we will have bodies like Jesus before he ascended to heaven, and God will, in a sense, marry the earth and heaven together at that time. He then begins to refute the restored earth doctrine being the time of the restitution from Acts chapter 3. He gives a brief list of what various groups believe 
that the time of rest restitution is and how some who don't teach the new heaven and new earth doctrine differ on what they believe that this is talking about. He gives a lot of details about this topic and concludes that the overall point of what Peter was speaking of was saving souls, not the eventual restoration of the flesh or cosmos. In other words, be a prepared people for Jesus when he comes to take us to a prepared place, which is heaven and not earth. So the time that God is reconciling everything is now. So we are in the middle of the time of refreshing, and so is everyone since the birth of the church. In chapter 20, Omri French, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, he answers the question, why are so many among us silent? He points out many verses that show that we are to study and know God's word and that we should speak out and teach the truth, which means at times you're going to correct those who are teaching wrong things. He then gives some reasons that some will remain silent. He says that some are silent because they are afraid of losing money, while others are afraid of offending people and thus putting the relationship above and beyond God and His Word. He also talks about how pride, lack of knowledge, and fear of being falsely perceived as more reasons why some remain silent. He makes two more points about how some want to remain ignorant about the doctrine such as new heaven and new earth. He then begins to explain that it is a sin to remain silent about the teachings of the new heaven and new earth doctrine. He explains how the earth is to be destroyed and how we are to have new bodies and that the language in Revelation is symbolic. Part of what he wrote reminds me that since Jesus is the first fruit and we're going to be raised like him and follow his pattern, this would include him never coming back to the earth to stay. This offers another argument that shows that we will not be coming back to this earth because Jesus will not be coming back to this earth. Instead, we'll be with him in heaven. In chapter 21, Brian Keenan will give us a contextual survey of Isaiah 65, verse 17, Isaiah 66, verse 22, 2 Peter 3, verse 13, and Revelation 21, verse number 1. Mr. Keenan does an excellent job of pointing out the context in which Isaiah speaks about the new heavens and earth and how the context is different when Peter and John talk about it. It's a great read. This time, I'm just going to share his conclusion because I think he sums up his chapter perfectly. He writes, Whenever the phrase new heavens and a new earth is found, context must be examined to ascertain its meaning. Clearly, in Isaiah 65, 17 and 66, verse number two, 22, the term new heavens and a new earth refers to the messianic kingdom, which was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2 and will continue until the last day when it shall be delivered to the Father for eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28. This eternity with the Father after judgment day, also known as heaven, Colossians 1, 5, Hebrews 10, 34, 1 Peter 1, 4, is turned by Peter and John as new heavens and a new earth. 2 Peter 3.13, Revelation 21, verse 1. Isaiah prophesies about Jesus' first coming, not his second. Peter and John prophesy about the final coming of Christ and the eternal spiritual dwelling that God will provide when this world is no more. May all Christians strive to reach that new heavens and earth by making sure they continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Colossians 1, verse 23. I personally like to keep things simple, and I've always viewed the terms new heavens and new earth as a phrase that denotes a major change. So Isaiah's prophecy about the new kingdom slash church and the new covenant, that would take place in the first century, and of course that would render the old covenant obsolete. That is a major change. Of course, Peter and John are talking about the next big change, which is the heavens and earth being burned up and we will either be in heaven or we'll be in hell. There will not be a renovated earth or a new earth that is created because the righteous will be where Jesus is and where he has been preparing for us, which of course is in heaven. In chapter 22, Johnny Skaggs will deal with the topic, In My Father's House, 
which has to do with John chapter 14. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this chapter because I believe this is one of the strongest chapters that disproves the idea that we're going to be on a renovated earth. And Mr. Skaggs does a great job of pointing this out and mentions two different views that some hold on these verses in John chapter 14. First, let's consider the main verses. John 14 verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. To me, this is so easy to understand. The Father has a house that has many dwellings. It is not on this earth, but is in heaven. Jesus is going to prepare this place for us whenever he ascends into heaven. And when he comes back for the final judgment, he will receive us and we will be where he is and get to enjoy this prepared place in heaven. Mr. Skagg points out that this chapter gives the new heaven, new earth doctrine problems and that there are two different approaches they take to deal with this easy to understand section of scripture. He says one group will say that Jesus is talking about heaven, but they redefine what heaven is and try to make it fit with heaven being on a renewed earth. This is a view that Randy Alcorn holds. However, most of Mr. Skagg's focus is on the second view that is taught by Wes McAdams. He thinks Jesus is talking about his glorification in the church. I've never heard this view myself, but he seems to give a fair description of what Mr. Uh, McAdams teaches. Now you'll have to read the details yourself, but I will summarize the view. McAdams agrees that John 14 verses one through three seems clear, but then he wants us to consider a wider context of these verses. And since one of the major themes of John is glory and the glorification of Jesus, he believed uh, that the rooms in our verses are talking about the church. He thinks it's more about the status than a place. He doesn't think Jesus is going to whisk us away to this place in the clouds. Instead, he thinks it's about bringing us into God's family and into the glory that Jesus has with the Father. Again, you'll need to read this chapter to see the other things that McAdams has written. But he concludes by writing this, one day he, that is Jesus, will take us fully into that relational status so that where he is, we may be also. You know, one of the first warning signs to me that throws up red flags is when you have to jump through hermeneutical hoops to explain away a clear and straightforward section of scripture. I have to agree with Mr. Skaggs that a major problem with McAdams' view of the mansions is that John says that they are in heaven and not on the earth. John is not talking about the church on earth, but he's talking about our new home in heaven that is not part of the earth. He then quotes Guy and Woods. In fact, I'm going to take the time to share part of that quote. Strange indeed in the light of the obvious import of this passage that the view occasionally emerges that the Father's house is the church, a view for which there is not the slightest support in the passage and is obviously erroneous for the following reasons. Number one, the Father's house then existed. Jesus speaks of it in the present tense. The church had not been established when these words were uttered. Number two, Jesus left the earth to go to the Father's house. One does not have to leave the earth to become a member of the church today since the church is here, not in heaven, and thus available to all who obey the gospel. Number three, the place the Lord went to prepare is where he went when he left the earth. He left the earth to go to his father's house, but he went to heaven. Therefore, his father's house is in heaven. The church is on earth. The father's house is in heaven. Therefore, the father's house is not the church. He also quotes Wayne Price, and he points out how 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18 agrees with John 14 verses 1 through 4. We will meet Jesus in the air when he returns. And nothing in scripture indicates that Jesus will ever set foot on the earth or some kind of renewed earth. He also points out from Hebrews 11 verses 13 through 16, how those from the past look forward to a heavenly country, not one here on this old earth. You know, he also explains that those who teach the new heaven, new earth doctrine will try and use John 14 verse two 
and verses 23 and say that the word abode used in those verses is used in the same way, thus showing that the abode will be on the earth. However, Mr. Skaggs rightly points out that while the word abode is used in both of those verses, they are talking about two different locations. John 14, 2 is about us going to the heavenly abode with the Father, while John 14, 23 is about the Father and the Lord dwelling in the heart of man. As another example of John 14, verse 23, he gives John 15, verses 1 through 10. He also gives a quote from A.T. Robertson about John 14, verses 1 through 3. Again, you'll have to read the book to read about that. Now, I've never heard anyone try to use John 14, 23 to defend the new heaven, new earth doctrine. But as I'm reading it for the first time, it is not hard for me to see how big a stretch this is to even attempt to use this as a good reason to disregard the clear teaching of John 14, verses 1 through 3. There are certainly more details for you to glean from this chapter, and especially from John chapter 14 itself which I think is a thorn in the side of those who are pushing the new heaven, new earth doctrine. In chapter 23, John Hafner covers the topic, the whole creation groaneth. He gives a brief summary of Romans, but primarily discusses Romans 8 verses 18 through 25, in which the new heaven, new earth advocates try to use to teach that the earth will be renewed. He explains some of the different views that some hold from this section of scripture. One thing he notes is as follows. Creation being delivered from corruption is a far cry from Christ and Christians eternally inhabiting a renovated earth. The words of Romans 8 are simply not enough to teach that the planet will be cleansed and changed into the eternal habitation of God's people. He also points out that the renovated earth idea disagrees with other parts of the Bible when it talks about heaven, because it teaches that heaven is in existence now, which is not on the earth. Those who teach the new heaven, new earth doctrine, have us going to heaven, and then heaven coming down to us, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. One of his concluding thoughts is not to allow anyone to use Romans chapter 8 to contradict other clear passages in scripture. Reminds me how some like to make doctrines from the book of Revelation that contradict the rest of the Bible. In chapter 24, John Hall looks at the biblical view of the celestial and the terrestrial. He talks about the human body and how it's made up of parts, such as hands and feet and so on, but will eventually die just as Adam's body died. However, the same body will be resurrected on the judgment day when the spirit returns to it. He also explains how the heaven that God abides in is different than the earth. Heaven is eternal while the earth is not. He introduces us to anthropomorphism. This is a a fancy, big, fancy word that simply means to describe something non-human with human attributes, such as applying human parts, such as hands and ears to God whenever he's in heaven, and of course he's a spirit, or describing hell with the physical terms of the Valley of Hinnom. Again, that's just to help people to be able to, on earth to be able to kind of understand what it would be like. He spends a great deal of time talking about the body of Jesus and what kind of body it was after he uh, resurrected and after he ascended to heaven. His main argument is that Jesus didn't enter into heaven in the same resurrected body because it was still flesh and blood unless the Bible was describing his human attributes again through that big fancy word anthropomorphism, which I have a hard time pronouncing, which he shows was not happening. He points out how we also will be resurrected like Jesus and our bodies will not be the same as they were before. He then uses 1 Corinthians 15 to show a difference between our terrestrial earthly bodies and our celestial heavenly bodies. Now maybe I missed something when reading this chapter, but I didn't see much in this chapter used to combat the teaching of the new heaven, new earth doctrine. Now, I know there were some things, but it was mainly showing the difference between our earthly bodies and our heavenly ones. Of course, one thing that would be pointed, you could point out about it, and I don't know if they all hold this view or not, where they're saying that we're going to have that same type of body that Jesus did before he ascended, and that's the one we're going to have here upon this renovated earth. So it would disprove that. In chapter 25, John McCormick 
deals with the topic of new heavens and a new earth of 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 14. This is one of the shorter chapters in the book, but it has many great points. He refers to a denominational man named Michael Whitmer, who has written a book about heaven being on earth and how the heaven we think of is, is temporary. It's a temporary place for the dead and for sinners. So he wants to remain here on earth. That's his, what he wants to do. Mr. McCormick points out how this would be impossible based on the clear scriptures from Peter. This is the verse, 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. McCormick explains that those who want to twist such an easy passage to understand must redefine what certain words mean. He gives several examples of the word pass away to show that most of the time when this phrase is used, it means that it ends. One example is when we are baptized, our old sinful self has passed away so that our sins are forgiven. They will never come back again. We will never be held accountable for them again. So when this world passes away, it will not come back. It will not be renewed. He points out how the word melt or dissolved means it's done or it's finished. One of his examples is in Acts 2.24 in which God dissolved the pain of death. This is the complete end of death from which Jesus was raised. He also adds the following. Additionally, the translators used melt for the Greek word tiko in 2 Peter 3 verse 12, used just this once in the New Testament. It means to perish by liquefying. So these words certainly suggest what Peter is saying, which is that the earth will be completely destroyed. It will pass away. Next, he deals with the phrase burned up. He points out that those who teach the new heaven, new earth doctrine will point out that there is a textual variant or you could say textual criticism in 2 Peter 3 verse 10 and that the Greek word eurestico, which means discover, should be used instead of katechio, which means burn up. He points out how Thayer says it would be strange but improbable for eurestico to be used in this context. Now I looked at several Bible versions and most of them translate the word burned up. It's only some of the newer translations that use words like disclosed, exposed, or laid bare. Since the phrase burned up makes a strong point against the new heaven, new earth doctrine, I understand why they don't want this to be the correct word used in this passage because it means the earth would be completely destroyed but that fits with everything Peter has already said. He also gives several examples to show this truth. He then shows how the earth was never intended to be our permanent home using verses like Mark 13, uh, verse 31, 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 18, Hebrews 11, verses 13 and 16, 1 Peter 2, 11, and also chapters 3 and verse number 11. He also shows that the phrase new heaven and new earth are used figuratively to show that something new is going to take place. And he quotes Wayne Jackson, who explains this point. Finally, he suggests that the renovated earth doctrine encourages worldliness and gives thoughts about that. Overall, I think it's a great chapter and worthy of reading. And while we have the textual variant there in verse 10, as they say, context is everything. Peter made several references to things passing away and melting, which shows that the word that should be used there is the one that most use in the older translations, which is burned up and not discovered or exposed or laid bare. By the way, more of the Greek manuscripts have the Greek word translated as burned up, but it is also true that some of the earlier manuscripts have the Greek word translated as discovered or exposed. Based on other parts of the Bible and including the context of this passage, Again, it seems that burned up certainly fits the context better. 
but don't allow this rare variant to distract you from the other things that Peter has said about the elements being burned up or from the other verses that you find in the Bible to talk about the earth being temporary. In one of the longest chapters in the book, Jason Rollo deals with the topic scholarship, the root of the problem. This is chapter 26. Well, I just spent a great deal of time on one of the shorter chapters in the book. I'm not going to spend that much time on this particular chapter because it has a lot of quotes from the teachings of N.T. Wright and Randy Alcorn and others. I certainly recommend reading this chapter, but the overall point is that you have to be careful about listening to those who are called the scholars because they're just people. Some have agendas and only look at scripture from an academic perspective or to try to push something that they believe in. For example, there are many today who are enamored with N.T. Wright, yet he's not a Christian, nor does he teach the truth about how to obey the gospel. Yet many look to him to teach them deeper meanings of scripture including the renovated earth doctrine. If a person can't understand the basic foundation of becoming a child of God, why would I want to trust his ability to teach me about other things? So Mr. Rollo is encouraging us to look to the true scholar, which is God, and to look to his word for your answers. You don't have to have a person called a scholar to help you understand the plain teachings of Scripture. Some of these alleged scholars have introduced all kinds of issues that should not have been an issue in the first place. Far too many are looking at what a man or a woman says instead of what God's Word says. In chapter 27, Bill Boyd looks at the topic, Are Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists Right? Though this is the title of the chapter, this chapter is more about the differences between these two groups and the renovated earth doctrine. As Mr. Boyd points out, those who teach the New Heaven, New Earth teaching don't like to be accused of being like these other two groups. And they are not like them in every way. But they do share the end result, which is a renovated earth. Mr. Boyd gives a brief summary of these two main groups and mentions several of the different views the New Heaven, New Earth doctrine uh, teaches. Now, Bill says that he loves his New Heaven, New Earth brethren but he encourages them to reconsider all the different verses that show that we're not looking for heaven on earth or coming down to the earth, but we are supposed to look above to the heaven of heavens. He then proceeds to give many verses to prove this point and also points out some meanings of certain words in these verses that help support the idea that heaven will be our final destination and not some kind of heaven or renewed earth or a heaven here on this earth. Now, I could have taken more time to give you a sample of some of the verses that he used, but this overview slash review is already pretty long. So I'd recommend, again, you read this chapter and study it for yourself. We have finally reached our last chapter, which is chapter 28. Terrence Brownlow Dendy will examine the Bible's description of the real heaven. He points out that heaven is used to describe three things in Scripture. First, it describes the atmosphere where the birds fly. Second is space where the moon, sun, and stars can be, are located. And third is the home of God. Of course, the home of God is where Jesus went to prepare a place for us so that when he returns, we can inhabit that place, John 14. He gives the view of heaven as stated by Islam and Mormons and then offers scripture that teaches that heaven will be our eternal home. He talks about what will happen in heaven and what will not happen. We'll worship in heaven, there will be rest in heaven, and there will not be any death, sorrow, pain, crying, or sin in heaven. And he concludes with who will be in heaven and who will not. Now I know this has been a long overview slash review, but I wanted to cover this book well. In my opinion, this is a great book to add to your collection. I know some don't care about end time views because there's nothing we can do about what will happen. So if we live faithfully to God, then we don't have to worry about such things because we can know that we will be with God even if heaven happened to be on earth. I certainly don't think we should be obsessed over end time views, but many do. Those who teach the rapture doctrine and the 8070 doctrine seem to make it the cornerstone of their lives. However, even though we have no control over what will happen in the end, it's important for us to know and to teach the truth. We certainly don't want to be guilty of dividing a congregation over an end time doctrine. I don't know where this renewed interest 
in the new heaven, new earth doctrine will be in 10 or 20 years down the road. But we need to be prepared because we have seen the 8070 doctrine start out as something innocent that was painted as a possibility, and now it has turned into a fellowship issue. The same thing could happen with the new heaven and new earth doctrine, especially if people start fighting over this topic and they cause division. What I find sad about all of this is that doctrines like these seem to pop up from time to time and they end up causing problems. As you learn, the new heaven, new earth doctrine is not new, but it has become popular among denominations and is becoming popular in the church. Why? Well, in my opinion, part of the reason is that each new generation that comes along seems to want to find something new, or in this case, they want to renew an older teaching because it's different from what is being taught now. And, you know, that makes you feel good. It's kind of exciting. You think, well, look, I made a new discovery here, or I made a discovery that they had right in the past. From my experience, many of our younger generation have become obsessed with denominational scholars and teachers, and they claim that we don't have such insightful men in the church. So they turn to men like N.T. Wright. But guess what? If they think they are getting better truth from these alleged scholars, then they're also going to start adopting their teachings on other matters. It also doesn't help matters that many of the Christian colleges are using denominational books to teach the kids. From what I have seen from my experience, these same Christian colleges will also have a mix of certain Bible teachers. They'll have some that are teaching from the Bible, doing a great job, and they'll have others that are instilling doubt into your children's minds. They'll say, ask questions like, uh, or say things like, um, uh, you can't really know the truth, or the Bible is um, flawed and has many errors. And they do these type of things. I've heard about it many times, unfortunately. No doubt we can learn some valuable things from denominational sources, but unfortunately many are using these sources as their only source. And then they start adopting their other teachings, which is dangerous. So this lectureship book will give you a lot of great information to help you study with others who are leaning toward the new heaven, new earth doctrine. It will also help enforce what the Bible teaches about heaven and the judgment day. It also shows the importance of using God and His Word as our main source and not blindly following the teachings of some popular man or woman. Thank you for your time, and I hope you all stay focused on Jesus.